Well, good morning, Adam Brook. <laughs> all right. Hey, happy Father's Day to all you dads. Um, yeah, we, we knew we were going to get bath bombs for moms. We were like, that's a great gift. We're like, what do we get dads? We're like, just give them bacon, all right? And we think they will, uh, they will be happy. So uh, check it out. See if you like the bacon. And uh, again, happy Father's Day to all of you. I just want to uh, say if you are a guest this morning, we're so glad that, that you are here and that you've chosen to be with us this morning. Just sit back, relax, enjoy the rest of this service. Uh, if you're watching online, glad you are also tuned in. I do want to echo what Pastor Tyler said um, earlier. We really want you at that annual celebration this year. Okay, it's going to be on Wednesday, the 26th. Um, we, we have a lot to celebrate as a church. That's all I can say. I mean, you're going to find out more at the meeting. Um, this was a great last fiscal year for us here at Edinburgh. Record numbers in a lot of areas of our ministry. We accomplished just some really amazing things, and that's because of you. And we want to celebrate what God did through his people and through his church. So listen, we're going to be, we're going to be serving Jets pizza. We're going to turbo cross that sucker. All right, so free dinner. Come here just for that. We're going to offer child care. Because we know it can be tough, but listen, it's summertime. Your kids have pent-up energy. Bring them to church, drop them off, let them get out some of that energy, okay? They'll have a blast. We're going to try to keep the meeting to an hour or less, and then if you have time and want to stick around afterwards, we're going to celebrate with root beer floats. So you're not going to want to miss it. Again, that's Wednesday, uh, the 26th. We want to see this place um, packed. We'd love to have you there. Now, right now we're in a series called A Time for Change. And we've been discussing these, these areas of our life that we need to be intentional in if we're going to be where we want to be in five years from now. And I just want to get you thinking about that in the series. Where do you want to be in five years from now? And this morning, I'm dealing with a very specific and, and important topic for all of our lives, which is finding your purpose. In five years, would you like to have a, a better sense that you are living out God's purpose and plan for your life, I think all of us would say yes to that. And that's part of my job as your spiritual coach, in a sense, is to help you discover what that plan is, what God's purpose for your life is, and to help you live it. Because it does require intentionality. Uh, I told you a couple weeks ago that growing up I had this dog named Ralph. Uh, Ralph was an Australian shepherd dog, a super fast dog. And it, it was the classic case where if, if Ralph saw a car go by and we left the fence open or the door was cracked, Ralph would run out of the house, run out of the backyard, and chase that car. And, and in fact, in one case, I, I was walking Ralph with my leash, and, and Ralph took off and, and booked it down the, down the road, uh, chasing after this car. And something happened that had never happened uh, before. Ralph actually caught the car. Okay, there was a stop sign, and the car came to a stop, and there was some, some traffic going by, and, and Ralph caught the car. Now, that had never happened before for Ralph. So, so Ralph's having like this existential crisis, like, what do I do? Do I lick the bumper? Like, bite a tire? And what he ended up doing, he just kind of sniffed it a little bit, and then he went and he colored a neighbor's mailbox, and then he, he kind of just ran off chasing after the next car. It's one thing when, when a dog chases after something and doesn't really know why they're running after it, only to find that in the end it, it didn't fulfill, it, it didn't satisfy. It's another thing when we do that with our lives. And as your pastor who loves you, I don't want to see you chasing after things that in the end do not matter. I want to see you finding whatever that specific purpose and plan God has for your life. And I want to see you thriving and living that out. And enjoying the blessings that come when we live in the plan and purpose of God. I don't want to see you, in other words, waste your life chasing after things that in the end will not matter. I want to see you discover God's plan 
And I want to see you living that out. And I know it raises a lot of questions when we talk about God's purpose and his plan for our life. And so I just want to start off uh, this message by, by saying two things about God's purpose and plan for your life. First, you need to know that God's plan is a good plan. You need to know that God has a good plan for your life. Not an okay plan. Not a mediocre plan. Not an average plan. God has a good plan plan for your life. The classic text is Jeremiah 29, 11. We read this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. God knows the plans he has for us. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. What an amazing promise. That God has a good plan for our life. I was looking at the Hebrew uh, the language this was written in this last week, it, it literally says that, I, that my plans for you are that of shalom. I, I have plans of shalom for you. Now, we often translate shalom into this word peace, but it's so much more than that. It's not just peace. It's talking about wholeness. God's plans for you, they're, they're one of wholeness, of being complete in Christ. It's the idea of having inner joy and inner peace and having good things in your life. doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect life. We live in a fallen and broken world, but it means God will be with you and God will put good things in your life and he will give you things to smile about. You will be whole. You will be complete. This is what God is promising us when we live according to his plan. Life's not going to be perfect, but there will be things in our life that cause us to smile and to have joy in our, in our hearts. Now, this is what's interesting about this passage because you might think that this was said to Israel when they're living in a time of obedience and faithfulness. That's not when God made this promise. God made this promise after the Israelites had been carried off into captivity into a foreign land, the land of Babylon, because of their sin and their unfaithfulness. And they're in their brokenness. They're in their pain. They're, after being, you can imagine, uprooted and carried off to be captives in in a foreign land, God says, I am not done with you yet. I still have a good plan for your life. Maybe some of you need to hear that this morning. You think, I've sinned. I've done something. I've blown it. I've made a mistake. I've blown my marriage. And there's no way God can say, God's saying, no, no, no. I still desire shalom for your life. For your life. I still want a good plan for your life. But here's the second thing we need to know is that God's plan is something I I have to choose. It's not just going to happen. It's not just going to fall in your lap. You can't just live by default and and think that you're going to just, by default, live out God's plan. It's going to require a choice on your part. God gave us something called human freedom. And, and we can choose. We, we can choose to walk in God's will. We can choose to reject God's will. We can choose to follow Jesus Christ and be his disciple, or we can choose to reject Jesus Christ and not learn from him and do the things he called us to do. Deuteronomy uh, 30, listen to this. Moses says this to the people of Israel as he's leading them through the wilderness, and, and they're about to go into the promised land. He says, today I am giving you a choice. You can choose life and success, or you can choose death and disaster. I am commanding you to be loyal to the Lord, to live the way he has told you, and to obey his laws and teachings. You are about to cross the Jordan River and take the land that he is giving you. If you obey him, listen to this, if you obey him, you will live and become successful and powerful. Friends, as your pastor, this is what I want for you. I want you to experience the success that comes when you live in God's plan. I don't want you to waste your life. He says, on the other hand, you might choose to disobey the Lord and to reject him. And so I'm warning you that if you bow down and worship other gods, you won't have long to live. Here, he's talking about idolatry. Turning our backs on God. Saying we love Jesus with our lips, but not being faithful with our actions. 
Verse 19, now I call the sky and the earth to be witnesses that I am offering you this choice. Choose life. Friends, God's given us this freedom. He's given each and every one of you, he's given me the freedom to make the choice. How are we going to live? Are we going to live within God's will? Are we going to listen to his word and do what he's told us to do? Or are we going to do something else? The reason God gives us this freedom is because without it, our love wouldn't have meaning. Our, our love for God would have no meaning without choice. If God, if we were just robots and we were just programmed to, to do everything God said, th- that wouldn't have any meaning. We'd just be programmed to do that. But God gives us the choice so that when we choose to do it, our love has meaning. It, it means something because we're choosing to do that. And God wants to know, are you going to choose to follow me? Are you going to choose to trust me? Are you going to choose to live for me and to put me first in your life? When we talk about God's purpose and plan, we often want to know exactly what it is. Uh, what, 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 what is it that you want me to do, God? We, like we want a crystal ball. God's plan doesn't often work like that. He, just, he doesn't tell us everything we're supposed to do in life. He, he doesn't tell us every choice we're supposed to make. Um, in fact, if you find a person who says they have it all figured out and they've got 50 years planned out and it's all going to go according to plan, you know, they know exactly who they're going to marry. They know exactly what ministry they're going to be involved in. Uh, they know exactly what job they're going to be working in. And, and, you know, 20 years from now, they know exactly uh, where, where their finances are going to be. Anyone who tells you that they have it, they know it all, just get ready to laugh. Because life doesn't work like that. Our relationship with God doesn't work with that, like that. Yes, he'll reveal to us stuff as we go along, but really the Christian life comes down to just day after day following Jesus. One day at a time. One day at a time following Jesus. Just doing the things that Jesus told us to do. We often want to know what are those things that we don't know we should do. We're like, God, tell me the things I don't know that I should do. Tell me. I want to know. But before God's going to answer that in your life, he wants to know that you're doing the things he has told you to do. Before God ever answers the question, God, what are those things I don't know I should do, that I should do? He wants to know you're doing the things he has told you you should do. He wants to know you're faithful. And trusting in what his word says. I'll just, I'll bring up one. Friends, this might sting a little, and I hope you hear my heart in this. How many of you tithe? How many of you give, seriously, you give 10% of your income? How many of you do that on a regular basis? Trusting that everything from God is his, he gave it to you? That takes faith, friends. But that's something that's revealed to us. And I don't say that because we're trying to make a lot of money here. Listen, we had a great fiscal year. Many of you did tithe. Many of you were generous. Our church is probably at the best financial place it's ever been in its history. That's not why I'm bringing this up. I do know, though, when when more of us start tithing, we're going to be able to do more ministry around here. We're going to be able to pay off our sprinkler system when Bill's probably going to come due this month. I, I'm just challenging us because these are the things God has told us to do. How can we expect to reap the rewards of his good plan for our life when we're not even being faithful with the things he's told us to do? Jesus said tithe. Tithe literally means 10%, by the way, in the Hebrew. Literally what it means. He said give a tithe. But don't also neglect mercy and loving other people. That's more than that. And I, I'm just challenging us. How many of us serve We could not do the ministry we do around here without faithful people who serve. And so you can get upset with me for bringing that up, you know, because it does sting. You need to know that's because I'm questioning your idol this morning. And God's saying, before I'm ever going to reveal to you things you don't know you should do, are you doing the things you do know 
you should do. And friends, I, I hope you hear my heart. I bring this up not because I want your money. I, I do want to see Edinburgh thrive. I do want to see Edinburgh doing more ministry. But I would even tell you beyond that, I want to see you living out God's good plan for your life. As your pastor who loves you, I do want to see you thrive. And I just don't know if we can do that when we're not being faithful and obedient to the things Jesus has said is what it means to be my disciple. It's something you, you have to choose. It's a choice that you have to make. And, and one of the examples, one of the biblical kind of heroes of the Bible that we see who lived out an incredible plan for his life was the person Moses. Moses. I want to talk about Moses a little bit this morning because Moses, he, he, he was nothing special. We're not told he had any gifts or anything like that. But yet God chose this man, Moses, to live out a pretty incredible plan. And probably of any person in the Old Testament, Moses is probably the greatest. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He's the one who led the people of, of Israel um, through, out of Egypt, out of, of bondage in Egypt. By far, Moses is certainly one of the greatest heroes of the, of the Old Testament. And the author of Hebrews tells us a few things about Moses that I want us to look at this morning that can help us, like Moses, fulfill the good plan that God has for our lives. And so we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11. There's just a few things that we learn about this hero of the faith. First, if we're going to live out God's plan, if you're going to live out the, the good plan God has for your life, you've got to know who you are. This is where it starts. You've got to know who you are. Hebrews eleven twenty three. 23, listen to this. Because Moses' parents had faith, they kept him hidden until he was three months old. They saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid to disobey disobey the king's orders. Now, what's going on here is at this time, um, the Israelites, they were, they were slaves in Egypt, and they were beginning to grow in such numbers. Their population was growing to such a degree that, that, that Pharaoh became scared that they were going to become so numerous, they were going to be able to overthrow the Egyptians. So he gave an order to have all the boys that were born put to death. Moses' parents do not want to put their son to death and so they hide him for three months, but when they can hide him no longer, they decide to put him in this basket and put him in the Nile River and just trust God. Well, as it turns out, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the Nile and she discovers this baby in this basket. She falls in love with this baby and takes Moses home and raises him as her own. So Moses grows up in the king's palace. He grows up in Pharaoh's palace, a, a, a prince of Egypt. You can only imagine. I mean, talk about having special privileges. But Moses is going to realize that's not who he is. He's not a prince of Egypt. He's a, he's a child of God. He's one of God's people, the people of Israel. Verse 24 says this, after Moses grew up, his faith, his faith in God made him refuse to be called the king's grandson. Moses realized who he was, one of God's people. My question for you this morning, who have you let tell you who you are? Who in your life have you let define you and tell you who you are? Have you let the world do that? I let the world just tell you that you're just here by accident? And that, that there is no ultimate purpose or plan for your life? You just kind of evolved and you're just here? That's what the world will tell you. Maybe some of you, you grew up under a parent who just was impossible to please. And it made you feel like you don't have any value. Or maybe it was an ex-spouse that said some words that still linger. Who have you let tell you who you are? Who have you let define you? Friends, I want to remind you of a couple things the Bible says about you. If you are in Christ this morning, 
If you are in Christ, the Bible says you are a child of God. You're a child of God. The child of the Most High God. Do you realize what that means? That means your life has special benefits. Your life has special privileges. You know, I, I love my, my kids, but it's summertime, and they've got a lot of energy, and they're not going to school, and there are days where they have driven me up the wall. Anybody else? I, I forgot. This is a holy group. That, none of you can relate to that. Okay? There are days where they've driven me up the wall, but listen, they are my kids. I love them. There is nothing I wouldn't do for my kids. They have special status. They got special privileges with me as their father. And and this is what the Bible says about you, that to, to all who put their faith in Jesus, God gave the right to be called the children of God. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe you are a child of the most high God? You know what that means? It means you are loved beyond what you can even imagine. You can't get your mind around how much God loves you. We will spend our lifetime in this life, and we will spend all of eternity trying to get our minds around how much this God loves us. You are loved with beyond a, a love that's beyond our, our human comprehension. You want to know how much something is worth, what is somebody willing to pay for it? How much are you worth? God was willing to give his life to save you. You are loved this morning. Can you just rest in that? You're a child of the most high God. Walk with your head held up high. That's no small thing. But the second thing the Bible also says is that we are forgiven. You know, many of us, we, we, we live in shame. And guilt, and many people today who go to church, they're playing a game of religion where they're trying to earn God's love, and they're trying to earn God's favor. But you can't earn God's love, and you can't earn his favor. What you can do is put your faith in Jesus Christ, that he paid for your sin on the cross, and that God offers you forgiveness through what Christ has done for you. I mean, whenever you say, God can't forgive me for that thing, God, God can't love me because of that thing that I did, do you, do you realize what you're doing? You're saying, Jesus, you weren't enough. Jesus, you weren't, you're not sufficient. What God wants you to do is realize, no, Jesus was the perfect, righteous lamb of God who gave his life. And when he gave his life, he did that so that all of your sin, past, present, and future, would be laid upon him. And he would absorb the justice and the wrath and all the spiritual curses uh, that we deserve in his body on that tree and die with them so that they would be done forever and you would be set free. Are you walking in your forgiveness this morning? God says, I've taken all your sin and I've thrown it into the ocean and I've put a no fishing sign there. So don't go fishing it back up. You're forgiven. If, if you've put your faith in Christ, your sin, you have been washed clean. You have become a new creation. And you can have a new fresh start. Is that good news? Amen. For a sinner like me, that is good news. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me despite the fact that I still sin. It's been paid for. Now, this doesn't mean we keep living in sin. We don't want to keep living in sin. Rather, God says, in my sight, I see Christ. I see perfection. I count you as perfect in my sight, even though I see all your junk. And so what do we do in our, with our lives? We try to catch up with who God already says we are. That's what you're doing. That's what we call sanctification or spiritual growth. You're trying to catch up and become the person that God says you already are in Christ. Pretty amazing. That's part of our purpose and our plan, being made more into the image of Jesus. Okay? If you came into my office, you'd see these little cards I have lying around. I have them in other places too, at home and in my car where I've just written down some of these truths, things that God says about who we are in Christ. I would encourage you to do that. Just get out some note cards or something like that and just write out, I am a child of God. I am forgiven. Write those things out. 
plaster them wherever you can see them, at work, in your car, and remind yourself who God says you are, because that's where it starts. We've got to know who we are in Christ. Okay, second thing, we've got to choose short-term pain for long-term gain. This one is a challenge for us, because if you're like me, you, you want instant gratification. Um, but the Bible would teach us that we need to be willing to choose short-term pain so that we get long-term gain. That's what Moses did. Verse 25, Moses chose to be mistreated with God's people. That's the pain, right? They were slaves. God, uh, Moses chose to be mistreated with God's people instead of having the good time that sin could bring for a little while. The Bible is very clear. Sin, it can be, it, it, it is, it's fun in the short term. Sin is fun. You can get your kicks, but then you're going to get the kick back. See, it's short-term pleasure, but sin will always lead to long-term pain in our lives. Would you all agree with me that it is easier to do the easy thing than it is the hard thing? Most of the time, right, it, it, is, it is a lot easier to do the easy thing than do the right thing or the hard thing. Like, what would you say is easier, to go find a quiet place where you can read God's word and spend some time in prayer, or to go turn on the TV and eat a bucket of ice cream? Oh, again, this is a holy group. I know which one's easier for me. But see, the Bible's teaching us if we will do the hard things now, and every successful person knows that if you do the hard things now, you, you can enjoy the benefits that come later. That, that if, if there's somewhere you want to be in five years, the question is, what are you going to start doing now? What hard things are you going to do now so that you can enjoy that in five years? I, I believe this. I believe some of the benefits in my life and the things that I'm experiencing today and the things that I know are from God, I believe it goes back to 20 years ago when I used to shut myself in my room and read God's word and spend time praying for my future. I, I remember when I first became a Christian, my friends calling me up on New Year's Eve saying, hey, let's go out, let's go do things. And these were good, good Christian friends. Like, let's just go have fun. And at that time in my life, I was like, no, I, I'm not going to go do that. And I would sit in my room in prayer and fast and pray for my future. Because, friends, I hungered and I thirsted for God's purpose and plan to be fulfilled in my life. Do you hunger and thirst for it? You, you've got to have a hunger for it. You've got to have a hunger for God. And I'm not saying that's right for you or that's what you need to do. But if, if you don't start doing the hard things today, you're not going to experience the benefits down the road. If you want financial freedom, you know what you've got to do. You've got to do the hard things now. You've got to stop buying the things, all those things you want. And, and you've got to start being frugal. And you've got to start putting money in savings. You've got to do the hard things now. Why? So that you can experience financial freedom in the future. Some of you, you need to say you're sorry to someone, and that's humbling, and that's hard. And you need to humble yourself, and you need to go say, I am sorry. I blew it. And for some of us, that is such a hard thing to do, just admit our mistakes. But you do that so that you can experience the, 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 the health that will be restored to that relationship afterwards. Others of you, you need to actually forgive somebody. There's someone in your life you need to forgive. And that's hard work and painful because you got you to think about it and you got to process it. But you forgive them now so that you can experience the emotional freedom that comes afterwards. And we've got to be willing to do the, 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 take the, endure the short-term pain now so that we get to experience the long-term gain that comes. The Bible teaches us a couple things about pain that are, that are important for us to understand. Um, First, pain can lead to spiritual growth in your life. 
Pain is not all bad. It can actually help you grow as a person. I love what uh, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, talking about pain. He says, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. He's saying as you do the hard things now and battle those temptations in your life and live for Jesus now, what's going to happen is you're going to begin to grow and it's going to begin to become easier for you to endure hardships in your life and to stay faithful and to stay on course. And in that process, your character is going to be developed. And then as your character is developed, you're going to start seeing God working and moving in your life and through your life. And he doesn't say it's going to give you salvation, but it is going to give you the confident hope of salvation because you're going to know, God, you're a part of my life. This, this is what Paul is teaching us here. And see, I believe this about some of us. Some of you, you are praying, God, I want this position at work, or I really would like to do this thing with my life. And that might be part of your plan. Some of you, maybe you have a vision for what God wants to do with your life, some ministry he wants you to start someday. Maybe there's some kind of even dream in your heart that God has put there, but you might not be ready for it yet. Your character might not be ready for it. And God is not going to put you in that position until your character has been developed and you are ready to live out that purpose and that, that plan God has for you. This is what we learned with Israel. God took them through the wilderness because he was going to take them into the promised land. He brings them out of Egypt, out of slavery. He says, I'm taking you into the promised land. Do you know how long it would have taken them to walk through the wilderness and get into the promised land? It would have taken them about a month. But they didn't have the character and they didn't learn the hard lessons God was trying to teach them to trust him when things are hard. So you know how long it ended up taking them? 40 years. I'd rather get into the promised land in one month, amen? Right, so the question is, are we being obedient even through the hard things? Because that's how our character grows. And God can use that pain in our life to develop us so that we can fulfill the plan he has for our life. Secondly, God can use pain in our life for eternal reward. The Bible teaches that he's going to reward us one day when we're in heaven. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says this, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Talking about this lifetime. In comparison to eternity, it's not very long. He says, Yet they produce for us a glory that is vastly that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. He's not talking about God's glory here. He's talking about your glory here. That as you're faithful and endure the, the, the hardships of this life, you are storing up for yourself rewards in heaven. You know, I was... I'm going to bring up somebody. He's going to be really embarrassed, and he's probably never going to talk to me again. But what he said was so good, you need to hear it. One of the, one of the people I absolutely love here at Edinburgh Church is, is Jim Nelson. And many of you know Jim. Jim is a servant here at Edinburgh. I mean, he's here almost every day of the week, like, serving in some capacity. I ask him to, like, paint rooms around here, and he, like, thanks me for giving him stuff to do. I, I would only pray and ask that every single church has someone like a Jim Nelson. I mean, the guy's incredible. And he said to me last year, he said, Pastor, the reason I do these things is because I'm storing up for myself crowns in heaven. That's what he referred to them as, which is a biblical term. James refers to them as crowns. But I'm storing up, kind of, I'm storing up the way my rewards in heaven. I'm storing up these crowns for myself in heaven. But Jim didn't mean by that, like, I, I'm doing this so, so, so everybody will look at me and go, ooh, there's Jim. Because he went on to say this. He said, I'm storing up those crowns for myself because one day I am going to stand before Jesus. And on that day, I'm going to take those crowns off and I'm going to lay them at Jesus' feet. 
Friends, that's a life of purpose. That is a life of purpose. That's what you want to be able to do. I would be a bad pastor if I didn't remind you one day you are going to stand before Jesus. Are you going to have some crowns to lay at his feet and say, Jesus, I did it for you? That's why we encourage you around here. I know sometimes it feels like a small thing, but we ask you guys, serve. Don't just come to church. Be a part of the church. What, what, what the Bible calls the body of Christ. I, I can tell you right now, we, we need some help in various ministries. We need help right now. VBS is right around the corner. We're expecting record numbers this year, but the problem is we've had to actually close our registration off because we need more volunteers to step up. For every one volunteer that steps up and says, yes, I'll serve, we can let five more kids be a part of VBS. And I know there are going to be children coming in here this year who are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and are going to have their life changed forever. And if you're in a position where you could, where you could serve and be a part of our vacation Bible school in a couple weeks, I just want to implore you to to consider signing up and, and, and volunteering your time. We need help every Sunday around here in our children's ministry. We really do. Um, our, our children's ministries are keep growing, so we need more volunteers. We're having a hard time keeping up volunteer-wise. So I just want to challenge you. Consider investing in that, this next generation. By the way, 64% of all Christians, listen to this, gave their life to Christ between the ages of 4 and 14. This, this is prime ministry. God is bringing ministry to us. <laughs> The question is, are we going to step up and do the ministry that God is calling us to? When you do that, you you are storing up for yourself crowns, okay? So it can lead to eternal reward. Friends, be willing to choose the short-term pain now for the long-term gain. You won't regret it, but this brings us to the last one. Value what God values, not what the world values. What are your values? What are you valuing this morning? Hebrews eleven twenty six goes on to say this about Moses. Moses knew that the treasures of Egypt, the wealth, the riches that he had at his, at his disposal, he said that he knew they were not as wonderful as what he would receive from suffering for the Messiah, suffering for Jesus. And he looked forward to his reward. Friends, what are you valuing this morning? Let me just show you a few things that Moses valued. Moses valued his purpose over popularity. Listen, if God gives you popularity, you can use it. Use it for good. Use it to tell people about Jesus. But don't go chasing after popularity. Because they're going to love you one minute and they're going to hate you the next. It's a fool's errand. Rather hunger and thirst for your purpose and plan in this world. The second thing Moses valued is he valued people over power. Again, if God gives you power, you can use it. You can use it to lead others for a good cause and for a good purpose. But don't seek out power in this world. Rather, value people because you're not going to take anything with you into heaven except other people. Do you know that? You're not going to take anything else except people. And that's why we are passionate here at Edinburgh Church about telling people about Jesus because we want to take as many people with us. Amen? (laughs) That's the heart of of Christ. And so we value people over power, seeing people come into a relationship with Jesus and spend their eternity with him. That'll give your life purpose. Moses also valued peace of mind over possessions. Peace of mind knowing that you're storing up those, those crowns in heaven, knowing that your salvation is secure in, in Christ. Jesus said, what good is it to gain the world and to lose your soul? What good is it, friends? Don't spend your life chasing after possessions. If you believe what you say you believe, you believe that you are going to one day step into eternity 
and spend forever with God. The Bible is teaching us that we are to invest our life right now in the here and now into what is to come. This is a short time in comparison to eternity. And I need to remind you, church, one day you are going to stand before Christ. Are you going to be proud of the life you lived? Are you going to be glad that you spent your life the way you did? So that when you stand before Christ like Jim, you're going to have those crowns to lay at his feet? Or did you value the wrong things and waste your life? Chasing after things that in the end do not matter. And so I just want to ask you this question. I want to get you asking yourself this, this question this week. Like Moses, is there anything in my life I need to leave behind so that I can fulfill the plan God has for my life? Is there anything in your life today you need to leave behind so that you can fulfill God's good plan? For some of you, it is a sin issue that you have got to deal with because it is going to rob you of living out the purpose and plan for your life. I, you know my story. I come out of drug addiction but I'll be honest with you, when I came out of drugs, that was a pretty easy choice to make. G granted, I had to get away from some people, and I, I had to put myself in new places, and I, I had to do a lot of stuff. But, I, that, that was actually, but then the new battle became pornography. And I started battling pornography, and that became the new addiction in my life. But I could hear God clearly. It was almost like an audible voice telling me, if you look at this stuff, if you give your heart to this, you are not going to fulfill the good plan I have for your life because you're not going to be able to hear from my spirit when you're being corrupted by this. It's one of the things God has reminded me over and over and over. If you're going to live out the good plan in my life, Brent, you have got to deal with that. So I got myself an accountability partner. I put a covenant eyes on my computer. If I look at anything I'm not supposed to, my accountability partner gets notified about that. Okay? Because I'm not going to let that get in the way of me fulfilling my eternal destiny. Do you hear me this morning? You have an eternal destiny. Don't waste it looking at stuff on a computer screen. That's depressing. Yeah, we should applaud that, church. We should applaud fighting, fighting the battle. It's a battle. One of my hopes, I'm just going to tell you one of my hopes, this is premature. I still need to have some conversations. I'm hoping we can get a recovery ministry off the ground next year. And maybe some of you want to help with that and lead that because we're all in recovery. We're all in recovery in some way. But man, pornography is a big one of our time. And Satan is using it to rob people of their God-given purpose. Man, not while I'm your pastor. Ah! <laughs> you have a destiny. Don't waste it. It might be sin. It might be even a relationship that's getting in the way. There might be a relationship you've got to leave behind. Because if you stay in that relationship, it's going to rob you of eternal things. For some of you, it is a job. You are just too busy. And you're going to work your life away for what? You say, I could never change my job. That's, it, it's great that you're taking care of your family doing that job, but are you there for your family? You say, I could never change. This is America. There are other jobs, friends. Do not waste your life working it away, valuing things over people, especially your children. And I know some of this sounds impossible, but that's why I'm going to end with this. Philippians 4.13, listen to this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe that this morning? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can conquer that sin because Christ will strengthen you. Believe it, church. Believe it. Don't waste your life. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do. I'm going to ask us to stand. I want to pray for you. I hope you hear my heart. I hope you know this is because I love you and I want the best for you. 
I want you to experience God's plan. I am so sick of hearing Christians give me excuses why they can't, fulfill, why they can't do the things God calls us to do. I, I don't want to hear, I don't want emails. I just want you to believe it. <laughs> Can we just believe it this morning? Just have a little faith and say, God, I'm going to stand on your promises like we sung earlier. And I'm going to believe if I do these things, I will see your good plan unfold in my life. So that's my prayer for us. I'm going to pray we'll have some faith. Heavenly Father, we need faith. We get so distracted with the things of this world. We get so off target. We start buying into the lies. And I just pray you would break through the crustiness that has scaled itself over some of our hearts and eyes this morning. And, and, and break us free from that so that we can see eternal things again with fresh new eyes and life in us. Thank you that you call us your children. Thank you that we are forgiven through what Christ has done, that he is the sufficient one, and that we can walk out of here with a new fresh start this morning. God, help us to start choosing the hard things over the easy things so that we can experience the eternal benefits that come from that. And Lord, ultimately help us to value what you value in a broken and lost world. Help us to be a light so that we can point other people to your son, Jesus. God, give us the faith we need to go out from here and do it this week. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Church, if you need prayer for anything, there will be people up here who would love to pray with you. Um, Otherwise, uh, go in peace. I love you.